Hi, I'm Paul Brody. We are in my shop. The man behind the camera is Mitch. Thank you, Mitch. Today we're doing a brazing lesson. We'll call it Brazing 101 and I'm going to show you a few things that I used to teach my class at Frame Building 101 out at the university. So let's have a quick look over here at my oxyacetylene setup. Large bottle is the oxygen, smaller bottle is the acetylene and we have a fluxer. This is an automatic fluxer. In here there is there's a tube. This is the line that is connected with the acetylene regulator. This line, it snakes around, comes in. There's a tube that goes down almost to the bottom. And then there's a level of liquid flux that comes up to about, oh, somewhere here. As you use it, it goes down, then you need to add more. And so the Acetylene, it, it bubbles up through the flux and the flux gets absorbed in the acetylene and it all goes to the torch. Oxygen line, acetylene line. So that's basically how the automatic fluxer works. You never ever put oil. Sometimes these are hard to open. You never ever put oil anywhere here. That's a big no-no. They'll call the bomb squad if you ever do that. So don't do that. On the end of the torch, I used this yesterday. See this little fluffy thing? That's flux. So we need to get that off that. I'll show you how I'm gonna do that. We need a, a clean nozzle. So it's, it's not very hard at all. You can take a, I got a little file here. It's a flat file. You can very gently, see as I do that, you can see the copper come through. And then I got a, a tip cleaner and there's there's different sizes in here this is the one that fits my zero tip and gently it's it's got a little file on it but you don't want to go in there and file it and enlarge the nozzle so very gently there we go that's all it needs it's a victor torch a j28 and i made this little holder here it's made out of aluminum. This is years old. It's held with a hose clamp. And then I have a mic stand. You can buy a microphone stand for not too much money. Very handy having a place where you can just put the torch in there and take it out at will. Very good. The red hose is acetylene. The, the green hose is oxygen. You always light the acetylene first. You switch off the oxygen first as well. So it's always acetylene first for lighting and switching off. I'm going to open it up a little extra and I'll show you what happens. Whoa. Okay, you see there's a gap. If you don't close down the acetylene and get rid of the gap, you can't open the oxygen. It won't work. So when you close down the acetylene, now the flame is joined up to the, up to the torch. If I go really low, there's a lot of soot that comes out. Can you see all that soot? You don't want that. You want to have a flame that's not too much soot and that's when you add the oxygen. And you, ink, you add it slowly. There you go. And now you, now you can see the cone. There's a cone in there. Now this is pretty bright and why, why this is so bright is because of the flux that's coming through the torch. We've got the inline fluxer like I showed you. Now there is, is, is two types of fluxes that I know of. There's the one like this, this looks like an oxygen tank. And there's also the gas fluxer from the, the gas fluxer company in El Rio, Ohio. I like saying that. And it's got a reservoir on top and there's lots more knobs and levers, but they both work pretty well. The ones that I used out at the university, I extended it by four inches because it allows more flux. It works better that way. So we're going to talk about a different flame, what the different flames are. This is the cone. From the end to there, that is, that is the cone. The hottest part of the flame is right at the end of the cone. If I want to make a larger flame, I add acetylene. 
Can you see there's a shadow now? From the end of the cone out there, there's a shadow. That means that there's extra acetylene in the flame. So this is a carburizing flame. If I back off the acetylene and just go down to the cone, that's a neutral flame. If I turn down the acetylene even more, it kind of looks the same, but the cone gets sharper. And that's an oxidizing flame. You do not want an oxidizing flame. It looks like a neutral flame, but it's a lot hotter because there's additional oxygen in there. You want a neutral flame. So to get a neutral flame, the easiest way that I know of is to add acetylene till you get a shadow and then you back it down very carefully and that's your neutral flame. So if I want a larger flame, I'll add acetylene, then I'll add oxygen. Can you hear how it's starting to hiss now? Sometimes a hiss is a sign of an oxidizing flame. Sometimes it's a sign of just a large flame. Sometimes it's a combination of both. So it's a little hard to tell sometimes. Let's see how large a flame I can get here out of a zero tip. That's a, that's a real hiss there. It's not often you would want to use that size of a flame. If you're brazing on some chain stays in behind a bottom bracket and you've al already done the fillet brazing on the down tube and the seat tube, that's when you might need a, a hot flame like that because all that mass of bronze is a big heat sink. If you want to go smaller, you close down the oxygen and that makes a shadow and then you close down the acetylene. So you can incrementally keep going down. When you're silver soldering on a frame like putting on a water bottle boss, you need a very, very small flame. Something like that. That's about the size of the flame that I would use. So those are the three different kinds of flame. There's oxidizing, neutral flame, and a carburizing flame. When you're brazing on a frame, when I'm brazing on a flame, frame, I want a neutral flame. Switch off the acetylene first, and then the oxygen. I've got gloves on. I want you to show you that I am safety conscious. I call it safety third. First is going fast, second is looking good, safety third. Then maybe that's a good way to remember. For the rest of the video, I don't think I'm gonna wear gloves because I'm gonna be very careful, not, not gonna burn myself. We're gonna do an exercise. We're gonna build an icicle. When I was teaching Frame Building 101, <clears throat> that was the first exercise that, that my students ever did was to build an icicle. We have a couple examples right here. So what we do is, to, is we start on a piece of tube or whatever and we start adding bronze. So we're using a 330 seconds bare bronze brazing rod. And this is what some of the students have done. And it's a bit lumpy, it's kind of inconsistent, but it's all holding together. So, oh, I can feel, see right there, I can feel a weak spot. It's gonna break, there you go. So it wasn't really held secure, it was held a little point right there. When you're brazing, let's say you're brazing and you stop, when you restart, you have to melt that bronze. You have to get, this is called the base metal at that point. You have to get that up to temperature before you add the rod. You can just put the rod right on top, but it's not really part of it. It's not adhered. It doesn't become one. So that's one of the mistakes students often make. One student made a beautiful icicle. I don't even know who this student was and they left it behind and this is what I used to show other students. I'd say, look, if you can build an icicle like that, then you can fill it braze. Because what's going on here is that you're learning how to melt metal. Most people have never melted metal in their life. Lots of the students that I had had never melted metal. So that was the first thing I had to do. I had to get them up to speed learning how to braze. So, when you're melting the metal, you are, are playing in that zone of melting, not melting. It's a, 
it's not much of, 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 a, of a temperature difference. You're playing in that zone. It's heating and then cooling. If you take the torch away for even one second, it allows the metal to cool down and solidify momentarily. And then you put the torch right back on and then you're melting more bronze. So let's, let's get set up here and I'm gonna build you an icicle and I'll see what I can do, okay? I got a couple different fluxes here I wanna show you. This is the flux that goes into the automatic fluxer. It comes in a gallon containers. A gallon cost me about $50. It lasts quite a while. It's real stinky. You do not want to get this on your hands or to breathe it in. You use a funnel, you use gloves when you pour it into the fluxer. This is the flux. It also comes from the gas flux company. This is what I put onto the tube before I do the brazing. It's type B paste flux. A lot of frame builders like this. I'm gonna build an icicle on top of this little tube here. So I'll start out with a little bit of flux on there. I wanted to talk about how much flux to put on because I've been watching some YouTube videos and some of the frame builders, especially the ones who start out, they are gooping on the flux and it's like it's a paste and it's everywhere and I don't think flux lasts very long when you put that much on your container must must run out pretty quick so from what I see you you just have to cover the area you don't have to build it up that's my experience when I was teaching frame building 101 and I'm teaching students how to use a torch, there's three things I would tell them, and I think it's still valid. You need to get these three things right, otherwise your chances of success are pretty small. One is the size of the cone. A larger cone means more heat. Smaller cone needs, means less heat. If you don't have the right size of cone, then it's either heating up too fast or it's not heating up fast enough and you're just waiting. So, so don't be afraid to make the cone a little smaller or a little larger and experiment. I've been doing this for enough time that I basically know how long the cone should be for this operation, that operation, whatever. So that's the first thing, size of the cone. The second thing is the angle of the cone. So sometimes if you want to get a lot of heat onto something, you have the cone aiming right at the metal. If you have a delicate operation and it doesn't take much heat, you might want it at an angle because now the heat is, it's still making that tube hotter, but it's not going into it as fast. And the, the third thing is the distance of the cone. Let's say this rod is the cone. That's the end of the cone. If you have the cone like that, you are putting a lot of heat right into the metal. If you pull it back, it's not so hot, but the heat is spread now. So if you wanna, if you wanna do a tack, for example, you wouldn't hold the heat way back here. You would hold the cone very, very close, maybe a millimeter away. It shouldn't be touching, but have it back just a little bit. That's the way to get the heat into the metal fastest. So those are the three things you ought to remember for sure. The size of the cone, angle of the cone, and on the angle, I can hold the torch like this. I call this a pistol grip, and then there's a pencil grip. If I'm brazing away, and that's where I want the torch to be. My arm's gonna get tired. You do this for an hour or two, you're gonna get a sore shoulder, things like that. So that's when you wanna hold it like a pencil because now you've still got the torch at the same angle, but you can do this for a lot longer. So please remember those three things. We're gonna light the torch now. I'm gonna light the torch and gonna get my brazing rod, 330 seconds, gonna build you an icicle. This is where we actually get to do something now. So I need about, I call it a, about a medium-sized flame. First thing you do is to heat up the tube, 
And you notice how I've got the rod really close because if I put the rod in to the flame a little bit, it, it preheats the rod. Okay. So I've melted, my flame's a little hot. So that was a little larger than what I wanted, but that's okay. So I'm gonna switch my flame, make my flame just a touch smaller. That'll give me a little bit more control. So I need to bring this up to temperature again because I've, I've taken the torch away. And then when I add the rod, I'm gonna have the torch at an angle. I'm not gonna have the torch straight down. So I start with it getting heat in there. There, I can see it melting. So now I'm gonna build an icicle. So I'm, I'm bringing the cone down to the rod and the cone, oops, the cone is focused right on the end of the rod because that's the easiest way to melt the rod the fastest. It's like a rhythm you get into. And you try and melt the same amount of bronze each time. That's partly where the consistency comes from. So like I said earlier, it's playing in that zone of melting, not melting. When I take the torch away for a moment, it allows that metal, that bronze to cool very, very slightly. Because if I heat it up too much, it'll sag, it'll become a blob fall off to the side. If you're just starting to learn how to fillet braise, this is an excellent exercise. So what's happening is I'm heating and then when I take, when I add the rod, it cools it very slightly. And then when I take the torch away, that's also allowing it to cool momentarily. I might make it look easy, but if you haven't done this before, it's a bit tricky. So I'm gonna take a little break for a moment and have a look. And that's, it's pretty consistent. And it's strong. If I start up again now, I have to make sure that I get this. This is the base metal, I call it. I have to get this up to heat. I can't just melt the rod and put it on top because it won't be strong. I have to get this back up to heat. So let's continue a little bit here. And if, you, if I hold the torch on there, hold the cone on there, you can see it when it just starts to melt. There we go. So I have the cone really close. When I would show students how to do this, I'd say, watch me and just copy what I do. That's the easiest way to learn. And they'd go to their brazing station and they'd do something completely different. They would be melting the rod about an inch above the base metal and then bring it down. And then by that time, the base metal is cool and they weren't having success. But if you keep everything close together like this, so that the base metal never really cools off, but comes up to heat very quickly, that's the easiest way to build an icicle. Some people have asked me, do I really need an automatic fluxer? And I say, well, it sure helps me a lot. So we're gonna do an experiment. When I finish off this rod here, I'm going to unhook the fluxer and we're going to see what happens. Okay, my fingers are getting hot. So it's not perfect. I got there's something going on there. Something, something happened there. It's a little inconsistent, but you get the idea of what I'm doing. See these little marks here? Can you see those? See these little marks there? that's an indication that it's left-hand thread. 
oxygen is right hand thread so you can't mix them up. So it looks like I'm making it tighter, but actually I'm loosening it. Le left hand thread. I bought this Fluxer in 1985 and it cost me $800. I don't know how much they are now. And the other Fluxer that I mentioned, it's from the, it's from the Gas Flux company. Those were $500 US. This 800 is, is Canadian dollars I'm talking. So there we go, we've hooked it up directly. I've probably got some flux in the line, so I'm just bleeding a little bit. So you're gonna see a different flame now. Oh, It's not gonna be as green, it'll be more of a blue color because there's no flux. Here we go, with, with no flux. So I can slow this down. Yeah, I've slowed it down quite a bit and then I can also speed it up. I see this one wants to lean more than the other one. And I don't feel like I have quite as much control, but it seems to be working. So maybe that answers your question if you really need a fluxer or not. So what do we see here? It's a slightly different, well, this is still hot, but yes, you can melt it and you don't have to have a fluxer, although it's not spreading on some steel. And I don't know if you noticed what I was doing with my hand. I can advance the rod. That's good, that's good practice using your thumb and forefingers. Because when the rod gets really low, really short here, I don't want to stop and put the torch down. And... That's hot. You want to just be able to advance it on your own. It's good practice. Our second brazing exercise, and this was the second exercise in Frame Building 101 as well, is to use a nickel silver rod. A, a nickel silver rod, it's a, it's a sixteenth of an inch thick. It flows really nicely. It's good for putting on, on brake bosses, things like that. You wouldn't use it for a water bottle boss. You'd use silver solder, but nickel silver is good. I have a tube here. It's an inch OD, and I think the wall thickness is 065, and I have a little piece of sheet metal plate, and that's 049 thickness. We're going to nickel silver the tube onto the plate and flow it all around. A good application for this is the bridge tube in between a couple chain stays on a bike. You want to get that to flow really nicely. You don't want to do any filing. This is really hard to file because even if you have a sharp file, it tends to skate over top. It doesn't want to grab in like on steel or, or bronze somewhat. So the first thing we want to do is to put a little bit of flux on there. And once again, I'm, I'm thinking about all those, some of those YouTube videos and Facebook posts I see where the flux is just piled on there. You don't need to do that. See how much flux I put on there? This is, this is all I need for this application. I think some of those other frame builders, they must have shares in a flux company or something like that. I used to say to my students, I said, which is going to take more heat? Is it going to be is it going to be the plate or the tube? And they would think about it, and some would say the plate, some would say the tube. But if you think about it, this plate goes all the way through, so it's underneath the tube. Whereas the tube, when we're heating up the tube, it's an edge. So I would say that the that the plate will take slightly more heat. So. If this is the cone of the torch, what I'm going to do is I'm going to circle around and I'm going to heat up the plate. And then I might even put the cone inside a little bit, get some heat in there. And then I'm, I'm going to tack it and I'm going to put one tack on one side. Then I'll flip it around 180 and then I'll tack the other side. 
If I just tack one side and start nickel silvering, as the nickel silver cools down, it pulls and the tube could lift up a little bit. So that's why I put a tack on one side and a tack on the other side. If this is the cone of the flame, I'm gonna hold the cone pretty close and I, I'm not gonna aim it right into the corner. I'm gonna back up a little bit so that it puts a little bit more heat onto the plate as opposed to the tube. So can you see that's aiming right into the corner and you notice how close the cone is. I'm gonna back it up a little bit and that's how I'm gonna tack it. Okay, here comes the preheat. And also what's gonna happen is it's resting on a, on a heat brick and the heat brick, it's not warmed up at all. So it's going to absorb a bit of the heat as well. So I've got a little bit of heat into the plate. I'll go inside. And now we'll do a tack. And the trick is to get each of them up to temperature at the same time. There we go. That worked out pretty good. Can you see how I've got a little tiny tack there? So I'm going to go to, I'm going to flip this around 180. See if we do the same thing here again. So holding the flame pretty close, but slightly towards the plate. And when the flux goes glossy or opaque, that tells me that it's up to temperature. So there again, we got a tiny little tack. Now, when I'm nickel silvering around, I'm not gonna hold the torch as close. I'm gonna hold the torch back. I'm gonna have the cone maybe five eighths of an inch back, 16 millimeters for metric. And I'm gonna heat up an area back and forth. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna heat from here to here. It's going to be a segment and I can do three segments on this side and three on the other side for a total of six segments. I'll heat it up and when I see this nickel silver start to melt, that's when I add the rod. So I'm trying to get this as smooth as possible. So I don't have the cone close anymore, but I'm still at a 45 and I've got about a medium cone. It's not too big, not too small. And I'm watching to see when that melts. There we go, see it melt? And I bring the rod around a little bit. Could have been a little hotter. And I go back over it. Just once or twice, just to make it flow. And then the same thing here. I'm going back and forth, but I'm watching when that's gonna melt. When it starts to melt. There, see it melt? And then that's when I put the rod in. And at first the rod melts pretty quick. Then it slows down and I go back over it. So right here, right about there, I'm going over what I just melted. And it's, the flame's at about a 45, so it's not really harsh. And I smooth it out, because I don't want to do any filing. See it melting? There we go. Put the rod in there. At first it melts quicker. Go back and I melt it around. Yeah, see it melt? Pull it around. Make it smooth. And this is the final, this is the final segment. If you do this right, you can't tell where you started or stopped. It's just all continuous. That's, that's what you want. Can you see on the flux here, see how it's a little bit of a tan color in there? That shows that the metal got a little hotter. It's not a danger sign. If the flux goes black, that means you've overcooked it. But so there's a little bit of a warning sign that says that mm, it's getting a little bit hotter. See over here, it's not there. That's just flux as it should be. 
These little bits here, see these little black things? Those are, that's just balls of flux there. See, it's kind of sticky still. Those are just balls of flux. So it's hard to tell how the nickel silver is under that until you soak it off. So I did one yesterday and this is what it looks like when, when, the, when the flux is soaked off and it's smooth. I don't think you can tell where I started and I stopped. So that's what you want. And if you look inside, you can see where the nickel silver has pulled through. And that's capillary action. That's because the heat is pulling the nickel silver or the bronze or the braze inside of it. And that's a good sign. That's how lug frames work because the heat pulls the, it pulls the filler metal into the lug. That's what helps to make the lug strong. So that's basically nickel silver. That's how it works. So if you have any questions, you can ask them in the comments. We'd like to hear from you. And thanks for watching our video. You can like, you can subscribe. There's some links underneath. If you're on a phone, there's a little downward arrow you, you, can, you can click on. Or if you're on your computer, there's two words, show more and you'll find t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, and you can buy us coffee. Mitch and I both like really good coffee. Thanks for watching. See you next week. Stay safe.